Looks like everybody's finding a seat, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. It's uh, on behalf of the Houston Energy Transition Initiative and uh, the Center for Houston's Future, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this discussion on the National Petroleum Council's recently uh, released study on clean hydrogen. As many of you know, the Greater Houston Partnership's Houston Energy Transition Initiative, or HETI as we call it, builds on the best of Houston's traditional energy skills and systems, really to leverage this region's industry leadership so we can accelerate global solutions for an energy abundant and low carbon future. And so meeting that dual challenge of growing energy demand with significantly lower emissions, HETI has formed working groups to advance Houston's distinctive competitive advantage in producing and delivering low carbon energy solutions. So we're pleased to co-host this event this morning with the Center for Houston's Future, an affiliate of the Greater Houston Partnership. The center has developed a national and global reputation for its work in building a Gulf Coast clean hydrogen ecosystem. And as part of that work, the center currently leads HETI's Clean Hydrogen Working Group. The center also took the initiative alongside GTI Energy and UT Austin to co-organize the High Velocity Hub, which was recently selected by the Department of Energy for a $1.2 billion hydrogen hub grant, which is the largest award in DOE's history. In just a few moments, Austin Knight's going to dive into the National Petroleum Council study, um, new hydrogen study. Uh, but first, for those who are unfamiliar with the NPC and its efforts, uh, the MPC is a federal advisory committee subject to the Federal Advisory Committee Act uh, rules. And the purpose of the MPC is really to advise the U.S. Energy Secretary and the executive branch by conducting studies at their request. It's important to note that the MPC does not advocate. Um, their role is really to be an advisor to the federal government on topics requested by the, the government. So the study group, which included more than 200 participants from inside and outside the energy industry, developed this recently launched study, Harnessing Hydrogen, a Key Element of the U.S. Energy Future. The study was chaired by Mike Wirth, chairman and CEO of Chevron. And as a side note, this was one of two concurrent studies that were completed and presented to the Secretary of Energy last week in Washington, D.C. And for those interested, the other study is charting the course, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from the U.S. natural gas supply chain, chaired by Ryan Lance, chairman and CEO of ConocoPhillips. And both studies are now available for download on the NPC website. And before I hand it over to Austin, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge the effort that goes into uh, coordinating these NPC studies and the impact they can have. As a member of the leadership team of the 2019 CCUS study, I have an appreciation for the level of coordination and stakeholder engagement that's needed to complete these studies that involve the input of more than 200 people, including industry, academia, government, and community stakeholders. And it's precisely that level of coordination and input and collaboration that makes these studies so valuable. This study will form the basis of work across many levels, from developing corporate strategies to informing academic research and to defining legislative agendas. So on behalf of the Houston region, HETI and the Center for Houston's Future, I want to extend my gratitude to the entire study team and particularly to you, Austin, for your efforts over the last 12 months on, or 24 months on this study. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Austin Knight. Austin's Vice President of Hydrogen for Chevron New Energies, a position which he assumed in February 2022. In this role, he's responsible for accelerating Chevron's lower carbon business prospects, including the commercialization of our hydrogen business opportunities. He serves as the chair of the coordinating subcommittee for the National Petroleum Council study on hydrogen energy, and he previously served as vice president, uh, large industries worldwide world business line for Air Liquide. Austin holds a bachelor of science in electrical engineering from Texas A&M University and an MBA from the University of Texan, Texas at Austin McCombs School of Business. Please welcome Austin Knight. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Jane. Um, thanks, Brett and, and others for hosting and for allowing us to have this panel. 
I was told to plan on 20 minutes uh, to go through the study unless Jane was really fast and then I would have 21 minutes. Uh, so I don't know how, how you did Jane on that. Um, but what I am gonna do is I'm gonna go pretty quickly through the content that we shared with the secretary and the full National Petroleum Council last week in DC. I'm gonna go fast. All of this is online with more detail. Uh, but then we're gonna have a panel of some of the folks that did a lot of the really detailed work and really wrote what you will be able to read in the report. Um, and I think the, the most benefit is gonna be from that discussion. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this. As Jane mentioned, our study has lasted and, and taken about two years. Uh, it's probably 18 months of work really here. Um, we wanted to go more quickly uh, but the reality is, we believe this is very groundbreaking. Uh, we think that we, we could not find a lot of other uh, studies and reports information to pull from just to compile and say, this is what we think about it. We actually brought together a very diverse group of people, which I'll talk about, and uh, for the first time ever created the type of content you're going to see here. We think it's robust. We think it's very grounded in the fun fundamentals of hydrogen deployment that will have a high impact for many years to come. And when we talk about hydrogen, we're talking about low carbon intensity hydrogen. We talk about carbon intensity. We don't talk about colors. Um, and we want to uh, be very clear that uh, this is um, not just any hydrogen. This is low carbon intensity hydrogen. We call it LCI for short. If I say hydrogen, that's mostly what I mean when I talk about this, just as a heads up there. The study was uh, compiled of an extremely diverse set of organizations and individuals that contributed here. There were about 100 different organizations, 70% um, of which were not oil and gas companies that participated. And so about 30% oil and gas, but we had a lot of manufacturing, technology companies, we had industrial gases, consultants, uh, EPC companies, power companies, and very important to understand about the NPC work that's done, there is also a large amount of nonprofits, think tanks, NGOs, universities that bring their expertise to the table for these studies and make sure that this is very objective and is addressing holistically the topic at hand. And I just couldn't be more proud of where we ended with this group and, and the output to arrive at some very influential findings and also 23 key recommendations uh, that I will highlight. The overall process um, did start back in 2022 and uh, we delivered this report last week. I'll just point out the landscape continues to change. So anybody that's been around hydrogen for any amount of time would say, well, things used to be different. That could be a week ago or it could be five years ago. Things move very, very quickly. And um, this report we believe is complementary, and it's additive to a lot of the great reports that are out there, a lot of the work the DOE has done. It incorporates IRA um, as it was uh, signed into law. It's, it is one of the policies that's incorporated, um, but the rulemaking for IRA just came out in December. I mean, we have not been adapting and adjusting to every potential change that comes we wanted to, again, ground in fundamentals and provide something that we think is objective and long lasting. What makes this study very unique is first of all, the diversity of opinion that I mentioned. That's why it took 18 months to put this together and we think that's why it's important. You have people that really build things, really operate, really manufacture or in this industry, all the best thinking um, has come to the table to produce something uh, here that is not replicated anywhere else. We worked with MIT and the MIT Energy Initiative on some very detailed modeling. And not only does that help this study provide a clear role for hydrogen, where does it fit and why and how now or in the future, uh, but we also go very granular into details that was just not available at a regional level for the US and anything else we found. There's a lot of discussion about hydrogen globally. There's even a bit when you get to the US level, but without a lot of specificity. 
this goes regional with a lot of specifics over time across scenarios. Just to ground everybody and how we did this work, working with MIT, we uh, first of all calibrated with IEA. We used their 2022 World Energy Outlook. Uh, we brought in a lot of expertise uh, from the participants. We brought in data from DOE or DOE labs, and we used uh, MIT then to look at the entire energy system and optimize around where do things go in carbon intensity across life cycles, both under stated policies and under a net zero by 2050 scenario. So we really bookended everything across two main outcomes. One is what's in policy today, state, local, federal, and two was if you have to force an outcome of net zero by 2050, what is the optimal way to get there at the lowest cost to society? Once you do that, then we can explain what the role of hydrogen is. So that's the approach we took. And this is what some of the high level findings look like. So first off, first finding, maybe not a huge surprise to a lot of people, we are not on track to reach net zero under current stated policies. You see a reduction in carbon, uh, emissions, um, but not enough to get to net zero. And so here you see the, the blue and the red bars kind of are those two bookends of the scenarios we ran with MIT. In the net zero scenario, hydrogen, low carbon intensity hydrogen can abate 8% of the US CO2 emissions. It's one solution of many that will be needed. And it is the best solution and the least cost solution for 8% of the total. What we see is across all solutions that are necessary, it would cost the US about 3% of projected GDP by 2050 to abate, fully abate all of the greenhouse gas emissions. That cost would be as much as 160 to $260 billion per year more if you weren't deploying hydrogen. There's a next best alternative this model does a lot of background analysis to see what's the best across each sector, each region, each application. Hydrogen is, is the best for 8% of these emissions, saving the US economy in the net zero case up to $260 billion per year when it's deployed. Just an idea of what's going on in the background. I'm gonna move through this really quick. We can come back to it later, but the model has to force a carbon price in the background to do that in that net zero case. And it's actually forcing prices up and up and up to get to net zero as high as $700 a ton to get that last ton of abatement. The average abatement cost over the period uh, it, by 2050 is about $250 a ton of CO2. But that last ton becomes very expensive uh, up to $700 a ton compared to that average. And this is just an example of what the model has to do in the background to get there. Keep that in mind as we start to talk about the economics of hydrogen deployment here in a little while. So who does hydrogen make sense for? Well, under the stated policies where you have IRA, you have hydrogen hubs, California has um, uh, ACT, ACF, uh, low carbon fuel standards. There's regulation in place today and policies in place today that do start to scale the hydrogen system. And essentially it, it about doubles understated policies. And under net zero, it would need to increase seven times from today. And today is mostly unabated. So it's abate today and grow about 60% of the demand in, in especially, well, in all cases mostly, but in the net zero case 2050 is going to be in heavy industry. This is where hydrogen is the right solution for high heat and applications in heavy industry, petrochemicals, refining, steel manufacturing. Um, uh, I mentioned chemicals, so, so all of that goes together there. And the rest is split somewhat evenly between exports where other geographies will be looking for the US to help them with their climate goals transportation, mostly heavy duty transportation, and also dispatchable power, where wind or solar power renewables uh, may have a mismatch supply demand imbalance in the grid that needs to needs to be uh, balanced. 
So hydrogen will fit there. And we'll talk about the regional deployment, but how will it be produced? And this is a big question that we get very often. And we call uh, one pathway renewable electrolysis. This is the green part of the bar here. This is renewable power to water electrolysis. We call the other pathway natural gas plus carbon capture and storage. So natural gas plus CCS. This is the blue part of the pathway here. You see a scaling of both in both cases over the long term. And I think that's a very important takeaway here. Um, there is continued growth. There's, a, there's an abatement of what exists today and there's a continued growth of both natural gas plus CCS and the renewable electrolytic pathway. The scale and the net zero gets much larger there, which you see on the green bar for the electrolysis path, but the overall cost of deployment is formidable. The capital costs in total to reach this net zero 2050 case in just hydrogen is $1.9 trillion. Of the 1.9, $1.8 trillion of that is for that green bar. And that's because the way the model has to work on the electricity system, it models that all the electricity is behind the meter. It, that's a total cost for all of the wind uh, uh, turbine, all, all the, all the all the yeah, wind turbines, all the solar panels, all the electrolysis, the storage, um, everything that's necessary to make that a reality in that pathway is about $1.8 trillion of capital. And remember that about $2 trillion is a pretty big number. Hydrogen could still be saving the economy $260 billion a year when this is done. Um, so it is a steep mountain in front of us, but it's one that's the right one to, to climb as we start moving through these solutions. The study will go into a lot of detail that is now available to you regionally of deployment, the sectors, the infrastructure, how it's best produced. If you're a producer in any one of these geographies, uh, you will be able to see what are the things that make hydrogen the right fit for the right sectors in your geography. Um, you will see here, we project about 60% of the total demand is going to be U.S. Gulf Coast, which is why so many of us do so much here with Center for Houston's Future or HETI, um, so much industry access to natural gas plus CCS, access to sun and wind. This is a good location for that. Also, California, U.S. West Coast with good policy, um, sunshine, uh, adoption that, that we'll, we'll see there. And then the Great Lakes is the third primary region we've highlighted. And the Great, Great Lakes also um, has industry. It has access to abundant wind, for example. There's good resources there. Those are three regions where the report goes to e into even more detail and specifics on how that build out might occur. So you'll have information and, and access to data very regionally around all of these elements over time and under the different scenarios, which we think is pretty cool. All right, this is the last big important takeaway of the study is that without a value on carbon, the math does not work for hydrogen. The reason this is deployed is because it's the right solution in valuing carbon emissions and the reduction of those. Even in 2050, even in places of abundance like the US Gulf Coast, you will still see a cost gap of low carbon intensity hydrogen to higher carbon intensity alternatives, what's being used today. And to orient everybody, the, the black bars are the existing use cases today. And the blue and the green are where we're projecting hydrogen costs go by 2050. And this is 2050, so the IRA is no longer in here. We're showing that in this case, there's still this cost gap even as costs decline and equipment becomes uh, more efficient and manufacturing ramps up. There, have to be, there has to be something to help close that gap. And that's what we talk about in the recommendations. And so there's some key enablers that we've determined are very important to help close those gaps because these things are not equal on cost, but they're not equal on carbon. 
All right, Jane, how am I doing on time? All right. So we split our recommendations into three main categories. We have policy and regulation. We have social considerations, impacts, and safety. And we have technology and research development and deployment, RD and D. The middle category there, societal considerations and impacts, is something that we found to be very impactful and important in this study. It's very important to this administration, and it's something that is fairly new to be incorporated into an MPC study. We worked this with the charting the course study that was led by John DeBar, which Jane mentioned um, in the opening that was also released last week. There are five shared recommendations that are very much aligned between those two studies with teams that worked a lot of this work hand in hand. Um, and you'll see there, there, there are quite a few recommendations specifically around those social considerations, local stakeholder engagement, things there that um, are, are more and more important every day. Um, I will go through each of these categories really quick, and then we'll get to the panel. First on policy and regulation, number one recommendation that's not new to NPC studies is a recommendation of a price on carbon. The reason you consider hydrogen deployment at scale where it fits is all about valuing carbon. We showed the chart. We think the most effective way that uh, that can be reached is through an economy-wide transparent price on carbon that's a level playing field for all, that's technology neutral, and let the markets work. Let the markets work to value the solutions that can abate carbon. We also recognize that it may be a stretch to implement an economy-wide price on carbon, especially in the near term. And while there's the IRA there today and that recognizes carbon intensity, um, we think there's more that needs to be done. We talk specifically about some alternatives. One alternative, or actually two alternatives, is around low carbon intensity standards. One for industrial production, so low carbon intensity standards for industry, and another is low carbon intensity standards for transportation. Something like what California does today with low carbon fuel standards, LCFS, could be implemented more broadly. This is pretty progressive thinking in terms of national policy that could be supported, but it does value that carbon abatement and provides a level playing field for people to meet those goals. We also comment specifically on 45V. The team with the diversity that we had was not able to agree on what good rulemaking would look like on every aspect of 45V. But I think it's very noteworthy that two main areas, there was very strong consensus. One is that a 10-year tax credit of 45V does not match with the way companies look at investment decisions. It doesn't match with asset life cycles. And so if that were better matched, it would be need to be longer but it would provide more uncertainty, it would provide more predictability, less uncertainty in making investment decisions, especially for those adopting, looking to switch to hydrogen from something else. We also think that GREET has some shortcomings in the way it's designed today. Um, it does not include uh, co-product allocation or, or even verifiable pathways of say lower upstream methane emissions through the path through, through the pathway of life cycle analysis. And we think that the GREET model should recognize the good actors in the system and the reality of co-production to allow these pathways um, to achieve lower carbon intensity hydrogen. It's real abatement, needs to be verifiable. We think that's important. We also talk about infrastructure capital. We talk about global standards. Uh, and we talk about permitting. We talk about permitting generally on the permitting process, specifically on large-scale interstate pipelines and Class 6 wells, which is for carbon storage, which is an essential component to advance this economy in both cases and for the long term. That needs to be easier. Just hit on the last couple bits quickly before we get to the panel. I talked about social considerations and impacts. We call it SCI. Very aligned with the charting the course study. We go into details of best practices on community engagement. 
um, clear structures and how to work in communities, how to make sure there's clarity in your materials of what you're doing, how to work with workforces and develop them and engage with labor. Um, many companies do this today. Many companies do this very well today, uh, but we still believe there's an opportunity for broader adoption. And this is an area where every community is different. Companies cannot underestimate the importance of that local engagement and working this with the communities in which they're advancing. Um, this is a piece that we've taken very seriously and in a very structured manner throughout the study. Additionally, everything has to be safe. Uh, without good stakeholder engagement and safety, you will not get social acceptance, which is a key enabler to doing any of this. All right, and then finally on the RD and D side, uh, we really focused on value chains and from two main angles here. One is getting the cost down across the value chain. Um, and the other is making sure those value chains are robust. So we talk about what can be done to lower the costs, um, to increase manufacturing, improve efficiency. We also talk about some gaps in current technology, such as hydrogen leak detection. Some of this goes hand in hand with social acceptance. Um, we need to be good actors and need to make sure that the climate benefits are actually achieved and technology needs to advance around hydrogen leak detection as well. Uh, and we talk about critical ma minerals, material sourcing, everything that's needed to ensure robust supply chains over time. The report goes into all of these details and there is a lot there. Um, the executive summary is about 70 pages of content, which summarizes all this. Um, that's the executive summary, you guys. So if you really want to read a thousand pages, I can tell you it is super impressive and thorough. You have access to all the data. Uh, we were super transparent on everything that went into this. And there is just a fantastic amount of detail around the recommendations of what this actually means when we say permitting reform or we say, you know, 45V needs to be addressed. There's all those details in the report. And um, we hope you read it, pick out what's important to you. And, um, and, and I just can't thank the team enough. So is it time to bring everybody up, Brett? Um, and then we'll do some Q&A. Fantastic, yeah. Okay, um, very impressive uh, amount of work. And I guess we're very um, uh, lucky today to have some of the folks that um, actually put this together uh, to comment on it. So um, I'm, uh, let me introduce them. Um, uh, first, uh, Mike Kirby, I'm sorry, Mark Schuster. Uh, Mark is the interim director of the Bureau of Economic Geology uh, at the University of Texas at Austin, where he leads the um, Bureau's energy research and their um, Geo Hydrogen Affiliate Program. He has had a long, um, illustrious career uh, at for over 30 years at Shell when he worked a number of roles and a PhD from the University of Wyoming. And then next uh, to Mark is Mike Kirby, who is Senior Advisor for Corporate Strategic Planning at ExxonMobil. Uh, he completed his uh, PhD at the University of Texas and a postdoc at um, University of California, Berkeley and joined Exxon in 1989. So a long career at Exxon in which he's held a number of senior leadership roles. And then finally, uh, Brian Fisher, who is currently at the Rocky Mountain Institute um, where he is leading RMI's efforts to decarbonize heavy industry and transportation, uh, which uh, hydrogen represents an integral part of that as we'll hear. Um, uh, Brian and I have known each other for many years prior to uh, RMI. He was in private equity and um, spent 15 years at McKinsey where he was a partner in the global energy and management practice. So uh, really a great panel. Thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, just a note on how we're going to conduct this. I think um, on your chairs were cards. Um, we're going to do uh, uh, kind of uh, take questions. So if you have questions, if you could fill out your cards, if you need a pen, uh, um, uh, Elizabeth there is in back can bring you a pen and uh, also collect cards. And um, uh, we'll do a few questions with the panel and then get to um, uh, your questions um, in a few minutes. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so Austin, you know, I think you presented this to the secretary 
um, was it last week? Last week. Last week. And um, she called this summary sobering, uh, given all the um, all the U.S. is doing to put hydrogen uh, support in place. So um, do you see that in the same way? And then, you know, how, how do you think, if, if so, how do you think we move forward on this? Well, the reality of this can be sobering. Um, so I think I, I think um, that her her statement you know, was very genuine as she as she looked at this and said, "Okay, this is sobering." But I don't think it's reason for despair. Right? What I what I see is that the current policy shows you get some activation, you get some doubling of the current system, and things start the foundations start to be built. Uh, but what's necessary is something well beyond what's currently in place. And that's what this report delivers, is it delivers now the tools and the understanding to be able to take the, the detail that's in the report and say, okay, now what do we do about it, all right? So I don't think it's a reason for despair at all. I think it can be sobering when you look at the reality of where we are, this doesn't just happen, but it is a call to action to say, now we know what happens and what doesn't happen and what could be done about it to get where we wanna go. Great, okay. Uh, other comments? Who would like to comment on some of that? Yeah, I'll jump in. I I actually thought it was a very positive, you know, response because I think it it provide this report as as Austin laid out. I think really provides I think for the first time a clear eyed view of what this is going to take. And I think many felt that hey, you know, we've got you know the DOE should be applauded for what they've done with the IRA, but you know the IRA can be a bridge to nowhere if you don't have, as, as we've laid out, some of these additional policies that are gonna be needed to close those gaps. So I, I think it, it showed that, yeah, it's great for activation, but I, th I still think there's quite a bit more to do. And I think that's, that's what this report delivered. Great. Yeah, and just to add to that, I think you know that comment actually can function as a catalyst to start to get things moving along. Because they, as Mike's pointing out, it's the, the reality is that we don't have enough in place to make this happen. So what are we going to do about it? Yeah. Brian, any comment? I think they said most of it, but uh, the only thing yeah. I had is it, I think these guys are spot on the the PTC the IRA and especially the PTCs and the the grants are kind of the slab and the foundation of the house we're trying to build and we just need to hang a lot of other things around it to enable this market okay okay so let's uh, maybe double click and get into the details here um, one of the things that I, we've you've invented a new term here or maybe it's not a new term but certainly a new acronym um, and that's moving to this idea of low carbon and intensity hydrogen I think you guys call it LCI uh, hydrogen. Um, we've been using, and I think even in your report, you show the different colors uh, of hydrogen. We're trying to move um, away from those colors. Can you can you talk about why you think um, this idea of um, LCI hydrogen more accurately and broadly uh, captures the concept of uh, carbon reduction than the colors of hydrogen? Uh, Mark, why don't you start the Yeah, discussion? sure. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I think it's a good question, and a question actually I, uh, I get asked a lot. You know, so why not you know, just stick with the, the colors? Well, uh, a couple of comments. One is, uh, and this was, you know, based on a lot of discussion we had the NPC, the, you know, the colors are, are qualitative terms and they're also subjective. And when we were looking at this study, you know, the, the key uh, goals were, well, how can we deploy hydrogen to have an impact on reducing uh, carbon em emissions in the U.S.? And what would the cost to society be? So right there, you need to have some uh, quantifiable metrics on how you're going to go about doing that. And they, uh, so those metrics include carbon intensity, and they also, in, of course, include costs and so, you know cost of production, cost of delivery, et cetera. So uh, we basically, in order to be able to address these questions from the secretary, we need to, to have this quantification. And uh, the, the term low carbon intensity, um, you know, we utilize to signal that we're technology independent. So, you know, we're not focused on a specific technology like green or blue or, or pink or, or whatever the color might be. But it's uh, what is the impact on carbon emissions going to be? And what is the, the, the cost of uh, utilization of that technology for uh, 
production as well as uh, deployment and, and delivery. And it, you know, we also in the study outlined that look, you know, we follow the guidelines that are presented in 45V uh, for uh, the thresholds. But those, as if you read uh, uh, 45V, they're also subject to change based on uh, you know new uh, modifications to greet. And as uh, Austin was pointing out, you know. If, I think a lot of uh, the, the uh, companies that are involved in the supply chain or the value chains need, uh, you know, recognize that they may have better mousetraps and so actually may have lower carbon intensity than what's currently provided in greed. Okay, others, Austin, you wanna jump in? Yeah, I mean, I think at best it's a, it's a good shorthand that people who know a lot about hydrogen production can use, but at worst, it, it tells you, you think it tells you something that it doesn't tell you. And I also think that's why you see all these different people coming up with all these different colors because they realize, wait, this is complicated. There's a lot of different ways you can go here. And gosh, it's not really that. So we need to put a new color designation to it. It just, for our purposes, it felt way more confusing than useful. And so the color designation can be useful shorthand, but the reality is we're focused on carbon abatement. And we need to make sure that the solutions really drive that regardless of whatever designation you're putting on it in the production pathway. Great, Mike. I can't resist. We, we argued about colors. As a UT person, I said, how about burn orange? <laughs> Austin wanted, wanted maroon. maroon. <laughs> so you could see where this was, this was going. So we, we kept it. I mean, it is important that even the secretary, the title of, of her, her request was clean hydrogen. And we immediately went back to the DOE and, and forced them to reconsider what they meant by clean, because clean doesn't mean anything. Uh, and as Mark said, it's really the, the quantification back to low carbon intensity, which is what we talk about in the report. And they admitted that, yeah, that, that does make a lot of sense. So I think we, maybe we didn't get over the hurdle, you know, of blue versus green, because it is, it is such a shorthand, but we did hammer home the the point that it's really uh, what's important is low carbon intensity. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, and as Austin kind of said, what we're we're trying to solve for the price of emissions reduction, and the only way you do that is you have to have an equalizer, which is look, you know, basically price that out on an emissions basis, and that's where we went to. And I think all of us, you know, kind of speak for all of us, and then every, the other hundred people that were involved is we are technology agnostic and we were just you know we're trying to solve for emissions reductions and and uh let again let the market kind of let the market solve for it based on the data that we had in the report okay i'm gonna call a little bit of an audible on you guys so uh but here it comes so now we have a new acronym here lci hydrogen what do we mean by that exactly who wants to define it on the mic. So LCI hydrogen, low carbon intensity hydrogen. And what we uh, share in the, in the report that look, any significant reduction in carbon emissions uh, would qualify as low carbon intensity. As, as I mentioned previously, you know, right now we, we f uh, follow uh, the guidelines within 45V. So that's uh, four kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of hydrogen for production on a well to gate uh, life cycle basis. But I, I think we, we don't want to be locked into any specific uh, threshold number or metric. You know, what we're after is significant reduction in carbon. So we want lower carbon and intensity hydrogen to be produced. Okay, other thoughts? Okay. Um, so this one's coming to Mike. Um, uh, Mike, um, there's been a lot of discussion about the demand for clean hydrogen and applications that can be impactful. And it was kind of interesting in Austin's presentation, we talked about this kind of this large gap between stated policies, which will get you to uh, two times increase and then sort of the net zero case, which gets you uh, to seven. Um, so tell me a little bit, paint that picture for me so I understand a little bit more about this demand side of the equation. And um, you know what is that going to look like? And particularly talk about the role of the hard to decarbonize sectors and how that might lead, and then these others uh, yeah. might follow along. Yeah, I think um, you know Austin laid it out that that the two scenarios we looked at were, were kind of the bookends. So in the state of policies, you're essentially doubling the amount of of low carbon intensity hydrogen. People don't realize that the United States is actually already one of the largest producers and users of, of hydrogen. And it's around 11 million metric tons. So essentially we were assuming about a doubling of that to about 22 million metric tons. 
And because most of that is is the industrial sector, think you know hydrogen that goes into you know upgrading transportation fuels, methanol, ammonia, a lot of that in the state of policies will be converting that unabated hydrogen. Sometimes people refer to that as gray hydrogen to uh, to low carbon intensity hydrogen. And then uh, uh, that's roughly about uh, sixty percent or so, and then another twenty percent each for, uh, which we haven't talked much about exports, which we think is a low carbon intensity hydrogen carrier like ammonia uh, and some transportation because of the uh, stated policies in places like California that are, are promoting hydrogen. But then, you know, to get to net zero, that's where you need this 7x increase in, in hydrogen. Again, we, we see that the industrial sector will lead the way. Uh, in addition to you know transport uh, transport and exports as they grow, we'll see more and more power because the model to get to net zero essentially said that the grid has to be net zero by 2035. And because of that, that's where hydrogen plays a unique role in that serving as an energy carrier to help buffer, you know when uh, when the renewables aren't able to provide 24 seven power as well as a long-term storage um, uh, capability. So that's why you start to see power start to grow in that, in that net zero scenario. So, you know, the big picture is we think the industrial sector is gonna lead the way uh, and will help to kind of de-risk, I guess is the way I would put it, some of the other sectors like transportation and uh, power. Okay, great. Others who wanna comment on this? Brian, maybe talk about a little bit about export. You guys have been doing a lot of work yeah. on export. So maybe so, talk about that one. Okay. And I'll kind of transition into talking about yeah, export and what it means for what this all means for here, where we're sitting in the Texas Gulf Coast and kind of the broader U.S. Gulf Coast. And so, you know, we think if we're going to make hydrogen work, it's going to happen in Texas. We and, and because we're blessed with natural resources here, we have low cost wind, we have the ability to store, we have over 500 big industrial assets. We already have hydrogen pipelines that are that are going across the state, and we have carbon pipelines that are, you know, an emerging carbon pipeline network. So, and we have, you know, we have the know-how to be able to move both electrons and molecules around. This is so. This is ground zero for hydrogen development. And Austin Skip, he kind of said that he has had said a lot in the previous presentation. And there's a lot of great facts, but one of the facts that I hope everybody picked up on is that up to 60% of the potential hydrogen supply in the US is likely gonna come from the Gulf Coast, 60%. So that's, you know, again, that just the numbers are kind of telling us the same thing. Our gut kind of told us, but the numbers and when we did all the modeling told us that this is where it's gonna happen. And it's gonna be anchored in what Mike said in, in industry, but it's also gonna be anchored by exports. Uh, right now, with the IRA, the lowest delivered cost of hydrogen into Europe is the U.S. Gulf Coast. It's the cheapest place to produce it in, in landed costs. Even you know, it even beats producing it locally in in Northern Europe because that's where most of the industrial demand is. So, uh, and there's a desire and a need uh, for Europe and Asia for low carbon molecules. So in a way you could see actually the export market maybe even developing ahead of some of the local demand market because of that desire for exports for low carbon molecules. But the other, you know, the other big opportunity here is going to be in industry, as Mike said, chemicals. So uh, that's going to be it. Um, also, you know, if you think about ammonia for fertilizer, you know, that's another opportunity. Uh, we do have some, you know, some steel production and that obviously hydrogen, the reason we like hydrogen for industrial use is because you need high heat and hydrogen can provide that 500 degrees C, 1000 degrees C, right, to help transform whatever your, whatever your input is. So it's going to be anchored in those, really in those three things. The last one, which is a little bit smaller of a demand, in aggregate, it's a little bit smaller demand, but it's probably closest to economic parity is mobility. So you think about, in particular, in trucking, drayage trucking, uh, trucking that's kind of 300 miles and greater, that is a better solution than EV. You know, there, you kind of have this war between EV, EV and, and hydrogen, and there's there's definite use cases for hydrogen for trucking um, that that we see. And you know, the biggest barrier we frankly see is it costs sixty thousand dollars to buy a used diesel truck. It costs 
three to five hundred thousand dollars to buy a hydrogen truck. So even though you might be on economic parity from a total cost basis over a lifetime, you know, you're you have a really big capital cost that you got to solve for. And again, so as you start thinking about additional recommendations that, you know, those could be in policy, those could be some of how do you overcome that barrier? Okay, so now we've sort of introduced this idea of, of applications and uh, regions. Does anyone else want to take a crack at maybe talking about some of these other regions and where you think uh, those what the applications are going to be there and how is this going to what's this picture going to look like in other parts of the country? Austin, you want to try it? First? I mean, as you said, Mike, Mike yeah. got a lot of the demand work yeah, here, sure. and so you've okay. looked at all the details of that. Okay. Yeah. You know the. The, the kind of way I look at it is that, uh, you know, just on what Brian said, is that you're going to have these, you know, again, back to the Gulf Coast, you think about Corpus Christi to Houston to Beaumont to Baton Rouge to New Orleans. I mean, there's just a huge amount of industry already there. Sure. And then you couple good ports uh, where you're going to have, uh, you know, potential for exports, you know, that industrial growth will continue. And I, I could imagine that helping uh, you know, things like trucking maybe into ports and then, then maybe that starts to grow to Austin or Dallas and you, know, you, you can just start to think about an ecosystem growing in the West Coast, which was this, probably the second largest, again, very, it's one of the largest, uh, you know, fleet operator states where you've got, you know, uh, very progressive state policies. So that was one of the few areas in the country where we actually saw transportation ahead of industry uh, because of those state policies. Uh, and then and then in the the Midwest uh, 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 Gulf, uh, uh, the, the Great Lakes, where you've got a lot of good wind power, you've got Appalachia gas, you've got steel industry, industry, other industries. So those three regions I could see growing and then maybe starting to connect. And that's the real question is whether or not these hubs uh, will start to grow to the point where you start to see connections between, and I almost kind of thought thought of it as like a triangle, you know, maybe there'll be a connection between the Gulf Coast, the West, and the Midwest, a uh, Great Lake region. Um, some of these other regions, you know, like in the Northeast, we or, or Northeast or Northwest, you don't have a lot of industry up there, you know, renewables aren't great, you know, gas is expensive, you don't have the infrastructure. Um, you know, th that may be more of a challenge. Uh, but, you know, we're talking 2050 too. So, you know, this is not a crystal ball, uh, but I think the report has at least laid out a some reasonable pathways where we could see this take off. Okay. Yeah, and I didn't mention it on the modeling, but the, this is not a crystal ball is exactly right. So a lot of expert expertise went into this, you know, input. Uh, the modeling is super sophisticated, uh, but this is... Uh, not a precise projection of the future. This is something that should be very useful to inform us on what reality could be, what it would, what would, it, what it would take to get there, or also what might influence different outcomes in the future. And so we do have we call vignettes, some some parts of the report that go into okay, this is what the the, the analysis from the uh, modeling was assuming. But here are some other pathways that people could consider either in lowering carbon intensity or other types of adoption that might be required. And that way you have now more of these tools to understand the nuance of that, right? Don't just take the, the modeling number and say, well, this is the number and that's only the number. There's a lot of things that go into that. We have full clarity on all the assumptions and everything so that you can you know, make adjustments if you feel necessary. Yeah, and just to add to this, so you know, we're talking about uh, regions on the, on the basis of w where we identify demand, uh, where we identify essentially resources for hydrogen uh, production, but also what's important is uh, you know, delivery. You know, it's uh, the transmission and also the storage that goes into this. So these regions are reflecting essentially all three of those. Uh, uh, themes or areas and, and to try to come up with an optimization and it's those three areas, you know, the Great Lakes, Gulf Coast and the West Coast that seem to be blessed with basically advantages in all three. Yeah, just the one thing I'd add and, and both these guys touched on it is in order to make this happen also is we need to be able to effectively and efficiently build pipes and wires because mostly the supply whatever, you know, the supply of power to make electrolytical hydrogen 
the supply of hydrogen than to create ammonia. Um, most likely where you're going to produce a molecule isn't going to be where you're going to either transform that molecule and sell that molecule to the customer. So we, you know, we have an enormous uh, opportunity and it's going to be an enormous task to effectively, again, build out an infrastructure that's going to be able to connect all of this. Uh, right. So that's pretty high on the list of things to solve for. Right. Um, well, really, I mean, a ton of material there. We're, I want to get to recommendations and start talking about what do we do about all this. And um, I did have just a reminder, uh, put your questions, note cards, Elizabeth um, is going to collect them. I actually uh, uh, have one already and um, kind of gets to the recommendations issues. So the study identifies the three key, key enablers and I'll uh, toss this to Austin first. Um, policy and regulations, societal concerns and impacts and safety investments in technology and R&D. So I want to ask you to kind of, um, you know, you, you laid out the 23 recommendations, but I think the question here is a good one. Um, are any aspects of this, uh, do they differ from what's going on at DOE? Uh, from the things that DOE is doing in the hub program and demand stimulation and PTCs, how do you how do you think about the recommend the 23 recommendations you guys have and what we have as current policies and then what needs to happen? You've obviously identified uh, you know a difference between the stated policy and net zero, so that's clearly something. But what are the other things that need to be worked on and that are different from what we're doing today? Yeah, that's great. Uh, so we do think it's additive to what's already happening today. And we think the audience goes beyond DOE because DOE and themselves are not gonna be able to enact the economy-wide carbon price, for example. Yeah. Right, so it helps inform on these energy topics. And really the audience is everybody in this room, it's everybody in Washington, it's everybody that wants to do anything with, with hydrogen. Um, and so you do see some differences. Right. A lot of what we hear from DOE, frankly, is, okay, so how much money do we need to put into something? Because they have the ability to, to fund some programs and write some checks. They don't always necessarily have the, the ability to write a new regulatory policy or do permitting and, and that kind of thing, right? So they can influence. We feel like this gives them now a lot of tools and details at their disposal to have the right conversations on those things. And the national labs can do a lot. And we talk about where we think public private partnerships could advance technology, for example. So that's something that they're, you know, it's in their toolbox. They, they, can, they can do something with the recommendations. There's others here that they're going to have to choose, you know, who really can do that and what, uh, what are they willing to, to advocate for within Washington. And I think other groups are very interested in this as well. The administration has a, hydrogen interagency task force. And I'm talking through all this with those leaders later today. Um, so it's not only DOE, it's really a broad swath of, of people that need to play a role in this rollout. Right, Brian? Yeah, I think the one, and I think this report set the context, which just said that carrots in the IRA aren't enough by and large to close that economic gap. And I think the DOE recognizes that. And so, what the DOE, not only DOE, but governments around the world are doing is offer, you know, looking at demand side incentives. So you probably saw Japan announce $21 billion of demand side incentives for hydrogen, Germany, $6 billion. And we're involved in H2DI, which we actually rolled out at Zero Week and announced at Zero Week with the DOE, which is uh, an entity we're going to create to help allocate a billion dollars of demand side incentives to some of the hydrogen hub projects. Um, because again, all of this works when you get, you know, when you can close the economic gap and you can actually get a long-term offtake agreement to get financeable projects. So, you know, kind of that's one vector. And then also, you know, we're working a lot with the voluntary buyers of trying to identify people willing to pay the green premium to again, buy those costs down over time um, to do that. So those are two big efforts that are happening in that, you know, as Mike kind of talked about on the demand side, that that's obviously where everybody's shifting a lot of time and attention. Yeah, I would. I just like to add, even though the secretary, you know, requested this study specifically to how to scale up low carbon intensity hydrogen in the United States, I think this report could serve as a blueprint for other countries. And uh, you know, I think there's a lot of interest from from Germany, uh, other EU countries, Japan, South Korea. I think I think they're going to pay a lot of attention to some of the recommendations that are coming out because of this carrot and, and stick um, issue, and then and then just you know, high level, I think we kind of shown a bright light on not just the production side, even though we have 45V 
recommendations, but the infrastructure, Brian, as you mentioned, and the demand side, because we were blessed with, you know, we had people from the transportation sector, the shipping sector, the airline sector, you know, it was a really, it was a really fascinating set of folks that really wanted to talk about, okay, you can produce it. How are we actually going to use it? You know, what's the application case? So I think that's, that's a, I think, I think that'll be a lot of, uh, uh, some good outcome from the from the study from those learnings. Yeah. Uh, just to add to uh, a comment on the uh, the process. So it's not like we've just generated this report and handing it over to the DOE. The DOE have been immersed in partnering with us as we've developed this network and, and doing this work and putting this report together. So this has been part of the the communication and, and effectively a, a year and a half handover to the, the DOE. So, you know, they, they, they know what's already been done. Okay. Um, I got one more question and then we're gonna, I, I got a stack of questions here. So I hope you guys, do you guys have a couple hours? That's a big this? stack. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, well, let me ask this one other question then we'll get to the, some of the questions the audience has. And this one goes to Brian. Um, talk a little bit about community engagement. Uh, the, the report said that there was inadequate community engagement practices that led to distrust to project developers and delays in projects, that's a quote and recommends that multiple stakeholders actively commit to comprehensively uh, consider and equitably address societal, environmental, and public health impacts. Um, tell me a little bit what that ought to look like. Yeah, so that's the that's the question is what it ought to look like. Because we'll, I think the starting point we got to is we recognize that we haven't done this right and we can do better, right? You know, through the 100 people in this, in this um, study and a commitment by all the parties to come to the table and try to do better. But we were missing one big key stakeholder in this and actually the communities themselves. And, you know, although this took 18 months, we recognize that if we came up with an answer, it wouldn't be a great answer because it wasn't developed collectively with the right set of stakeholders because we're missing a critical stakeholder in all of this. But, you know, what, we'll tell you what we think it looks like. And we have some ideas in the report, we outline in the report of what we think it could look like. But, you know, it kind of starts A with just a recognition that we want to solve for societal, environmental, um, you know, uh, environmental harm that kind of some of these projects and try to mitigate that and create some benefits for, you know, for disadvantaged communities. Um, I think it also involves kind of upskilling and education of all parties. And, you know, the third is kind of collaborate, you know, collaboration across this and that also role clarity. You know, what's the role of government? What's the role of business? What are the role of communities in trying to solve for this issue? So I think those are the four elements that we think what good looks like, but largely we want to define what good looks like with the right set of stakeholders in the room. So, you know, the first thing we've asked for is a DOE to kind of further study this and advance this and create that, you know, kind of that lighthouse and that beacon for us. And I think the second idea we had is obviously Justice 40 projects are required to have community benefit plans. One of the recommendations we have is extending that in requiring community benefit plans for all government funded projects. So that's, you know, that's a start. Um, the second is creation of what we're calling community hubs, community engagement hubs, right? In a way, centers of excellence where we can actually have this dialogue um, by region because it does vary by region. And I think the third is just more support and outreach for communities, um, more funding support and outreach for communities. So those are the, you know, the start of the recommendations, but we recognize that there's a lot of work to be done to solve this. Okay, other, other thoughts on that? Okay, well, let's go to some questions here. So uh, I'm just gonna start to plow through some of these. Um, so some studies suggest that coupling a carbon price with regulations, uh, emission standards is more efficient than a carbon price alone. Do you agree uh, with regulations as a way to avoid high carbon prices? Like $700 a ton that you mentioned. So is there sort of a, a combination? It, how do we think about this idea of standards relative to a carbon price? Is it a substitute for a carbon price? Is it additive to a carbon price? What do we, how, how do we want to think about these sort of things? I'll, I'll take that. So, so yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of arguments out there about what is the best mechanism. And, uh, you know, uh, a lot of folks feel that an economy-wide price on carbon, which, which is transparent, it would be the most efficient. We recognize that that is a, uh, could be a tough road to climb. So, uh, one of the, and I, I think it's fairly progressive, you know, some of the recommendations we came up with, which was, hey, a bridge, and in fact, I think Secretary, uh, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Grabtree even said, you know, these 
recommendations that were being promoted for the low carbon intensity transportation and industrial standards could be a bridge to an economy wide price on carbon. And, you know, just if I just pick the transportation one as an example, the low carbon fuel standard in, in California, you know, over the past 10 years or so has reduced the carbon intensity in the transportation sector. However, it's tailpipe only and it tends to be more favored towards EVs. So what we thought, let's take a step back. Could we make this national? Let's think about this as a well to wheels it includes fuels and vehicles. And frankly, we don't care if it's an EV, a hydrogen vehicle, biofuels, all should compete. So put it on a level uh, uh, playing field, agree to a carbon intensity reduction standard, and then let the market uh, drive it. Uh, so that if you're above that curve, uh, you pay into it. If, if, if you're ahead of that curve, you get a credit. So it's very similar to low carbon fuel standard. Now we didn't go to a lot of detail on how you do this, uh, but it was, it was kind of laying out the philosophy of how we think some of these national standards could work um, in lieu of a, an economy wide carbon tax. Other thoughts? Uh, well, I'll ask a question on that state or state or federal or both. I would rather not have a patchwork of state uh, regulations. I think if you could do this federally, and that's what we said, a national standard, that would make a lot more sense. Right. Okay. Uh, here's a question on 45V. You're not going to escape it. Uh, uh, this says, do you find the 45V tiers for the PGC to have the right associated CIs? So have this has these been structured right? Because we have the we have kind of the th the dollar and then it jumps to three dollars at a very low CI the 0.45. Is that the right way to think? We need do we need to think about these different we, we, should there be a sliding scale or something like that? Yeah, how do you, I'll, how I mean, do you want I'll, to talk I'll about let it? These guys speak to some of it as well. I, the the starting point was the 45V rules are are what they are, and they're they have a, a tiered system that values higher value for lower carbon. And, and so we thought that generally looked good. We did debate quite a bit around, well, is, 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 are the tiers right? Is the value right? And, and how should we think about this? One thing we comment on is there's a bit of a cliff effect um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a tiered stair step. It's, it's not a straight line, um, but we couldn't get agreement on if it was reasonable to expect anybody would address making this not a stair step in a straight line. Instead, what, what we recommend is uh, some flexibility on how we deal with that exact cliff in each tier. And so there are some recommendations in the report or a recommendation in the report around uh, some some allowance, basically, like some some period of grace there within those tiering. Um, so that if an investor expects one thing and it like misses it by 0.01 of a percent that, you know, you're not significantly uh, out of out of the money on your total investment of what you made. But you guys can speak to more details on that. Yeah, I agree with us. I think what we want to make sure there is just some flexibility because it is you know, once you cross the threshold, that's a pretty big economic consequence that happens. And so you need either, and, you know, there's a lot of different ways to solve for it. And that's where actually the IRS and DOE are getting comments right now. And, you know, one way is you just have a little bit of tolerance around those bans. Um, the other way is, you know, if you penalize, you penalize not annually, but kind of by the hour, right? If you kind of, you know, again, the one hour that your renewables aren't, aren't, producing and you're going to be drawing off grid power and you're going to have a coal plant or a gas plant behind that, as opposed to having that impact your entire year, you might just get penalized for those specific hours that happen, which again, creates, you know, creates a, bu you know, creates a buffer. Okay. So, you have a oh, you've got a lot of questions. Okay, I got so. a lot of questions here. So I want, I want to veer into this um, idea of, um, you know, infrastructure and how we get infrastructure development, you know, talk about a little bit about permitting, uh, where that should reside, talk a little bit about pipeline regulation, where should that reside? We have something going on at the Railroad Commission right now. You know, there's questions at FERC. You know, how do we how do we think about all these questions about the rest of the regulatory framework that have to do with permitting pipelines and that sort of thing? Who wants to take that one? Uh, I'm going to start because I'm going to let them handle the details. There, so there was a lot of discussion and evaluation of what are we talking about when we talk about pipeline 
Yeah. Uh, and and so you'll hear us talk about unblended hydrogen pipelines. This just means it's a hydrogen pipeline. It's not yeah. anything else. It's primarily hydrogen. It's for hydrogen service. And you have some localized networks today that exist. And in the end, we're not trying to change the philosophy of those pipelines that exist today or say that somebody can't continue to build under that type of model. What we focused on was the larger um, like trunk lines, backbones, interstate pipeline development that may be required, especially as you start to think about, do these different demand centers get connected? Um, so there was a lot of debate around what's the right timing of that? Um, and is there a framework for it? Do we need a framework for it or not? Um, and, and in the end, we decided, like, even if the timing isn't exactly now, uh, we do need a framework for it because somebody that wants to go do that needs to understand how would they do that? How would they get these pipelines permitted? And so we propose that um, small local networks can continue. We also propose that for people wanting to go big and claim eminent domain, uh, that would need to be open access pipeline and FERC regulated. And we got into a lot of details then about what that would look like for that different application, right? And that's an application that doesn't really exist today in hydrogen, but it does exist today, obviously, in other, other products, natural gas and other products. Uh, other thoughts on regulatory framework? Yeah, I would just, well, I would kind of tie that back to, uh, you know, the techno economics that we did in the modeling shows that, you know, trucking hydrogen, either compressed cylinders or, you know, uh, uh, through um, other means gets very expensive. And so, as you pointed out, you know, moving electrons and molecules around, I think the only way to do that in a cost-effective way is you're going to have to move it through pipelines. And uh, so I, th I think we struck a good balance, recognizing that merchant uh, hydrogen producers have a business model, but also recognizing if you want to do this on a large scale, uh, you're going to have to have some federal oversight um, to help with that. Yeah, and, and I think it just add to what Austin and Mike are saying, it, it's in, and actually, uh, Brian touched on it earlier, it's, it's having a, a predictable regulatory framework that you can work within, right? So if you know what the rules are, you, you know what the time frame for a request valuation is, um, then and we want to upscale hydrogen, or I'd like to see at least that uh, enabled. Uh, and to do that, you, you're going to have to build a lot of uh, pipelines and storage facilities. Yeah, so just two other things. In specifically for Texas, you could imagine a lot of in you know intrastate pipelines being developed. And so, as Brett said, we 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 need a clear regulatory framework here. And I and it's not just hydrogen; it's a three-legged stool, right? It's it's hydrogen, carbon, and electrons and power. So those all you know, as you look at where you're going to solve for those, all three come into play. So we need clarity clarity and a framework around all three of those. Okay, we're gonna veer into technology and innovation. Here's a question. Does technology innovation, especially from Texas, drive supply and demand? How does Texas become that innovation hub? And I just wanna add maybe one other sort of um, addendum to this question. Talk about how we integrate the, um, the hubs, you know, which are really more high TRL levels into sort of this idea of developing the technology engine. Has anyone given any thought to that or was that addressed at all in the study? I, I don't know if we got specifically into, um, you know, Texas itself, but I think we we made some some pretty key recommendations around how to reduce the costs. As you know, Austin laid out, there's still a pretty big cost gap, but technology has a key role to play. And so, you know, anything we can do to reduce, for example, costs of electrolyzers or fuel cells, make them more durable. Um, you know, things like that could could significantly reduce those those cost gaps. And we have such a strong ecosystem between industry and uh, uh, and the universities, whether it's University of Houston here or or Rice or UT or A and M. I mean, we're <clears throat> most of the universities we have strong partnerships with. And um, you know, Brian said it. I think Texas is is really going to lead this this hydrogen revolution. And I think it's going to be through the partnerships between industry, local government, universities, uh, uh, national labs, where they make sense. 
um, I think I think there's a lot a lot that's going to happen here, uh, and, and and will tie directly into the into the hubs. Yeah, this is where we have the activity. This is where most of all of this is going to get produced, and we actually are we have a venture accelerator called Third Derivative, where we try to take early stage technologies kind of out of the lab into the warehouse. But we actually have just are going to start a new one that's focused on from more of the warehouse to the commercial scale pilot, because that's where another gap exists. We're choosing to put that in Houston because again, this is where all of, you know, all of this is going to happen. So we have the capability, so we have the people, and this is where we have, you know, potential investors as well. Okay. Um, we got a question here on nuclear and the role that nuclear can play um, in the energy mix, uh, particularly in power for electrolysis or, other equipment for our hydrogen production. So how do we get nuclear into the mix here? And what does that look like? Is it small yeah. nuclear reactors? Is it? Yeah, it may be a kickoff. So yeah. that's on. Um, so we didn't uh, include nuclear per se, but we, uh, in the, in the, the, the study, but we did recognize that look, it, it this is essentially a zero carbon or, or very near, uh, a very low carbon uh, way to generate uh, uh, electricity. Um, I think, Given the advent of particularly the small uh, modular reactors, and you know, there it looks like their growth, as, as well as looking at nuclear reactors that uh, you know may have some uh, surplus uh, power that they could utilize for uh, powering up electrolysis. All those should be in the mix. Now, was it included specifically in the study? No, but we recognize that this is uh, an opportunity. Yeah, look, the benefit of nuclear is it provides con a consistent, reliable source of power and a big source of power. Um, and that's what these projects need. They need 24-7 power, you know, low carbon intensity power. So, and look, there's a lot of, there's a lot of companies and a lot of investors that are putting, you know, putting money, real money behind developing that market, right? Obviously, big issue is cost. You got to get costs down. Okay. Um, we're running out of time. I got a couple more questions for you, and then maybe we'll... Uh... Uh, you can do one-on-ones afterwards. Um, but one question is, uh, this is more towards the uh, demand side. Um, how were derivatives treated, such as e-fuels? Uh, were those included, or was it mostly just talking about hydrogen? Yeah, th those were included in the modeling, although you know, e-fuels specifically are pretty high on the cost curve. And um, you know, the MIT recognized that you know, there's a whole range of uh, different types of, of fuels, um, uh, but those you know, those are going to be costly and um, at least, you know, in the near term are probably unlikely to make a big impact, um, certainly for the transportation sector. It, there's already a pretty high hill to climb just for hydrogen fuel cells. E-fuels are, are even likely more expensive. Other thoughts? Well, um, that's, if that's the biggest demand source right there, you know, particular for low carbon fuels, aviation, and as Mike said, we, those are the furthest out on the cost curve, but the biggest, biggest slug of demand that could come in. And so right now we're, we're primarily feeding that through biofuels. And, you know, the question is a transition of what we call power to liquids, right? How can we transition there as that next horizon, bring those costs down closer to economic parity. But again, it's a big, big demand source. Okay. Okay. So here's the, uh, here's the final question. Uh, I'm going to give this to Austin and then others can uh, weigh in. I heard Secretary Granheim say, say, holy cow, when she heard the $1 trillion number. First, did she actually say that? And what, what has been her reaction to the report? She may have said that. It's on video, so somebody can go back and, <laughs> and, and check the tape. Um, and yeah, one, $1 call it $2 trillion. That, that is a lot of money. And we looked at the last decade of all upstream spend in the US, it's about $2 trillion, right? So there's there's a lot of capital investment. Now it's capital investment between now and 2050. And that's to get to these this net zero objective. Uh, so you have to value carbon. And that is showing that this is a solution where hydrogen fits better than anything else. So you save still. <laughs> Uh, it could be worse is, is uh, maybe not the right message, but um, you save up to $260 billion a year for American taxpayers. So yeah, it's a lot of investment, but that's the goal. That's why you're doing it. Um, again, 
I think this is bookended, right? And and so you guys can weigh in on this answer because we were asked, hey, how should we think about the fact that all the electricity is behind the meter in that analysis and you have all this money going into renewable electricity production? And my response is, is that this in, in a way creates a ceiling. I don't know if there's an attic above the ceiling, but um, but there are other things that can be done that uh, integrate with the grid more efficiently, that recognize uh, the lower carbon intensity, uh, that maybe you could see drive you to a number less than that $2 trillion. But it's still a big number of capital for a purpose that results in the climate goals we've set out to achieve. Other thoughts? Go ahead. Go ahead. But yeah, I think it's, to me, it's one word, which is scale. People, people that are not familiar, those of you that are in the ener energy industry get it, but people really struggle with the scale that we're talking about. And we like to talk about gigawatts and gigawatts, and people don't know what you're talking about. And, and it's because the scale is so enormous that I think, again, the value of these kind of studies where we had a large group of folks, but we all came together and we put, we put some price tags on this and, and we put the scale into context. And people really, uh, yeah, I think, I think people get taken aback. And again, I applaud uh, the DOE for, you know, the $8 billion that they put out there, but put that into context, what, <laughs> what Austin just said, the 1.9 trillion. I mean, it really puts things into perspective, but I, I think that's a, it's a bookend. And again, it's not a crystal ball, but I think it, it did provide some perspective on what is really going to be required to, to get this this thing moving, uh, it's a very important element of of solving you know uh, reducing emissions, uh, but it's going to take a concerted effort uh, you know with the government, industry, uh, local communities to to make it happen. Brian, did you want to play in? Well, I'm, uh, I think two things. One is our hope is that we can drive those costs down. So the 1.9 trillion doesn't isn't 1.9 trillion, and we can ride the hydrogen cost curve down like we have solar and wind over the last couple of decades. So our hope is that number gets cut in half and even more and comes down. And I think the other thing is, you know, this is where 1.9 trillion sounds like a lot, but Tropical Storm Uri was a hundred billion dollars just in a three-day event for Texas. And so, right, you got to kind of price in some of those externalities and kind of say, we're going to pay for it in one way or the other. Um, and so how do we, how do we, you know, how do we optimize that cost equation? Yeah, right. I, maybe just a, a comment, I, you know, I, I think it speaks to, look, we're in an activation stage right now, you know, it, to go up to scale, as, as Mike was saying, it's, it's going to cost a lot. I mean, this is just enormous, you know, ginormous. Um, I, you know, I, 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 from coming from the university, I have a lot of belief in technology, but I tell you, to get to scale, we're also going to need policy to, to kind of push things along. And so I, I think that comes through with the, this study. Okay, Austin, last word. It, it, I, the, the scale, absolutely. And from some of the questioning, I, I, took, I took away that maybe there was this thought that, okay, we're asking the government to fund $2 trillion and put this in. That's not what you see. Right? You know the high velocity hub. You see, let's say, a billion dollars becomes is, yeah. or is matched by like $10 billion of private investment. You get the policy right. You start making breakthroughs in technology. Industry can do this and will deploy capital. Uh, the numbers have to work and the technologies have to be there. Okay, industry, that means you guys. <laughs> I wanna thank the panel. It's been a great panel. We obviously have lots to work of work to do. I just wanna have a last, uh, maybe a commercial for the Center for Houston's Future. Uh, we do have a hydrogen steering committee. Uh, if you're interested in being involved, it is somewhat of a pay to play thing, but if you are interested, we'd love to have you involved because these are where those kind of questions on creating this ecosystem, uh, hopefully for the Gulf Coast are gonna get, um, get in, uh, resolved. So excellent discussion, guys. Great piece of work. Congratulations on all the work you're doing. And obviously, you know, I tell people, sometimes people that, you know, the ball game hasn't even started and we haven't even sung the national anthem, but, but maybe we have sung the national anthem here and we'll say that it's the NBC study. Uh, so thank you for uh, uh, providing us with your insights and uh, look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you, Brett. And feel free to stay around uh, and, and chat. We have uh, 